Hello, hello. Good Sunday afternoon to all of you who are joining me for the live of today's read along. Ah, uh, so I am so ready to get this chapter done, you guys. I am <laughs> excited. I actually am surrounded by post-it notes, you guys. It's so insane. I'm like, okay, Aunt Isabel sounds like this, Aunt Alberta like this, Uncle Herbert like this, James Wellington, Benjamin, Georgiana, Gladys, Olive. Oh my gosh, you guys. <laughs> I hope I can get everything straight. Uh, I'm gonna do my level best. I, I love doing voices. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, oh, first off, uh, Arcady Durrell. <laughs> Welcome, by the way. Uh, first one on the chat. <laughs> That's, you know, hand waves. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, happy to see you here. And Red Tempest <laughs> says, hopefully we get more, un more bad Uncle Benjamin jokes today. Oh, you will not be disappointed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> aren't his jokes the worst they're awful but they're still like hilarious but awful <laughs> i love him and hate him um as long as he's not as long as he's not bullying our girl i'm fine with his jokes they're stupid super lame but <laughs> anyway um all right so <laughs> i'm glad that you guys are here i don't know how many of us are gonna make it today today is a sunday i scheduled this i don't when I scheduled it last night. Hopefully people are um, are able to join. If not, they can always do the rewatch. It'll be fun. <laughs> yes, more bad jokes. Yes, we will have plenty of bad jokes. But this, I think the center of it now is going towards Valency, as you guys remember from the last read along we had. Okay, so in case none of you guys have read this book or have joined in the previous live reads, first of all, what are you doing? Get out of here. No, no, no. I'll give you a TLDR version because it did have a slow start. Uh, we had Valency is basically total wallflower type, quiet, afraid of everything, 29 years old, unmarried, in her connection, that's a disgrace. But she learned that she's going to die. And she's all of a sudden is like, yo, I've been afraid all this time of things that now are not even going to happen. And all these people that I've always been like very careful to not offend and that have made my life so hard. Like, why, why am I even catering and pandering to them? Like, that's it. No more of this. I'm just going to live my life. Probably she can't do crazy things like travel the world or whatnot, but at least she will try to be more authentic to herself. Appearances can go hang. <laughs> Let me get some water. Hmm. All right, so I am ready with water, chapstick. I got the book. Um, anything else that I need to fill people in on? Nothing comes to mind. Basically, um, more, more valency stuff. <laughs> right. Uh, Valancy's like, yeah, I'm gonna die YOLO. That's right, YOLO. Now we did get a few a few um, other people and cast that that were introduced and they will come back. Uh, we had, they mentioned uh, Roaring Abel, so we'll see a little bit more of that later, but I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yeah, I probably am. I should just start reading. How about we just start reading? It is 12.05. <laughs> you should I do 10 minutes of talk? But I'm trying to not forget the voices that I have in mind for these people. So I'm just going to do the things. I am too excited to read this, these chapters, you guys. So I'm sorry if I don't do the requisite 10 minute banter that I always do and <laughs> just get started. By the way, I hope that you have noticed I am changing the music a little bit. We have new stream music and that is um, because I was able to get some new music thanks to my members and supporters over on Ko-fi. Um, so 
when you guys support this channel, well, this channel and the other channel, <laughs> you're helping so that the quality of work can be improved. We have new music so you don't get sick of the old stream music. We're listening to this one is called, uh, what is this? Is this called Day Trip from the artist Avis? Avis? Avis. I would say Avis in Spanish. A V E S. Okay. So, yeah, let's continue on the Blue Castle. I'm excited. You're excited. We're all excited. Let's do this, everybody. I got the wrong page. Hold on a sec. Hmm. Bless this food to your use and consecrate our lives. To thy service, said Uncle Herbert briskly. Aunt Wellington frowned. She always considered Herbert's graces entirely too short and flippant. A grace, to be a grace in Aunt Wellington's eyes, had to at least be three minutes long and uttered in an unearthly tone between a groan and a chant. As a protest, she kept her head bent a perceptible time after all the rest had been lifted. When she permitted herself to sit upright, she found Valancy looking at her. Ever afterwards, Aunt Wellington averred that she had known from that moment that there was something wrong with Valancy. In those queer, slanted eyes of her, we should always have known that she was not entirely right with eyes like that. There was an odd gleam of mockery and amusement, as if Valancy were laughing at her. Such a thing was unthinkable, of course. Aunt Wellington at once ceased to think it. Valancy was enjoying herself. She had never enjoyed herself at a family reunion before. In a social function, as in childish games, she had only filled in. Her clan had always considered her very dull. She had no parlor tricks, and she had been in the habit of taking refuge from the boredom of family parties in her blue castle, which resulted in an absent-mindedness that increased her reputation for dullness and vacuity. She has no social presence whatsoever. Oh, whatever. Oh. She has no social presence whatever, Aunt Wellington had decreed once and for all. Nobody dreamed that Valancy was dumb in their presence merely because she was afraid of them. Now she was no longer afraid of them. The shackles had been stricken off her soul. She was quite prepared to talk if occasion offered. Meanwhile, she was giving herself such freedom of thought as she had never dared to take before. She let herself go with a vivid, no, with a wild inner exultation as Uncle Herbert carved the turkey. Uncle Herbert gave Valancy a second look that day. Being a man, he didn't know what she had done to her hair, but... He thought surprisingly that Doss was not such a bad-looking girl after all. He put an extra piece of white meat on her plate. What herb is most injurious to a young lady's beauty? Propounded Uncle Benjamin by way of starting a conversation, loosening things up a bit, as he would have said. Valancy, whose duty it was to say what, did not say it. Nobody else said it, so Uncle Benjamin, after an expectant pause, had to answer, Time! And felt that his riddle had fallen flat. He looked resentfully at Valancy, who had never failed him before. But Valancy did not even seem to be aware of him. She was gazing around the table, examining relentlessly everyone in this depressing assembly of sensitive people, and watching their little squirms with a detached, amused smile. So these were the people she had always held in reverence and fear. She seemed to see them with new eyes. Big, capable, patronizing, voluble Aunt Mildred, who taught herself the cleverest woman in the clan, her husband a little lower than the angels and her children wonders. Had not her son Howard been all through teething at eleven months? And could she not tell you the best way to do everything, from cooking mushrooms to picking up a snake? What a bore she was, 
what ugly moles she had on her face. Cousin Gladys, who was always praising her son, who had died young, and always fighting with her living one. She had neuritis, or what she called neuritis. It jumped about from one part of her body to another. It was a convenient thing. If anybody wanted her to go somewhere she didn't want to go, she had neuritis in her legs. And always, if any mental was required, she would have neuritis in her head. You can't think with neuritis in your head, my dear. Oh, what an old humbug you are, thought Valency impiously. Impiously? Impiously. Whatever, I'll look it up later. <laughs> Aunt Isabel. Valency counted her chins. Aunt Isabel was the critic of the clan. She had always gone about squashing people flat. More members of it than Valency were afraid of her. She had, it was conceded, a biting tongue. I wonder what would happen to your face if you ever smiled, speculated Valency unblushingly. Second cousin Sarah Taylor, with her great pale expressionless eyes, who was noted for the variety of her pickle recipes and for nothing else, so afraid of saying something indiscreet that she never said anything worth listening to, so proper that she blushed when she saw the advertisement picture of a corset and had to put a dress on her Venus de Milo statuette, which made it look real tasty. Little cousin Georgiana, not such a bad little soul, but dreary, very always looking as if she had just been starched and ironed, always afraid to let herself go. The only thing she really enjoyed was a funeral. You knew where you were with the corpse. Nothing more could happen to it. But while there was life, there was fear. Uncle James, handsome, black, with his sarcastic trap-like mouth and iron-gray sideburns, whose favorite amusement was to write controversial letters to the Christian Times attacking modernism. Valency always wondered if he looked as solemn when he was asleep as he did when awake. No wonder his wife had died young. Valency remembered her. A pretty sensitive thing. Uncle Benjamin had denied her everything she wanted and showered on her everything she didn't want. He had killed her, quite legally. She had been smothered and starved. Uncle Benjamin, we see pussy mouth with great pouches under eyes that held nothing in reverence. Uncle Wellington, long, pallid face, thin, pale yellow hair, one of the fair sterlings, thin, stooping body, abominably high forehead with such ugly wrinkles, and eyes as un <laughs> and eyes about as intelligent as a fish. Wow, as intelligent as a fish. Um, and eyes about as intelligent as a fish's, thought Valency. Looks like a cartoon of himself. Aunt Wellington, named Mary but called by her husband's name to distinguish her from Great Aunt Mary. A massive, dignified, permanent lady. Splendidly arranged, iron gray hair, rich, fashionably beaded dresses. Had her moles removed by electrolysis which Aunt Mildred thought was a wicked evasion of the purposes of God. Uncle Herbert with his spiky gray hair. Aunt Alberta who twisted her mouth so unpleasantly in talking and had a great reputation for unselfishness because she was always giving up a lot of things she didn't want. Valency let them off easily in her judgment because she liked them, even if they were, in Milton's expressive phrase, stupidly good. But she wondered for what inscrut inscrutable <laughs> But she wondered for what inscrutable reason Aunt Alberta had seen fit to tie a black velvet ribbon around each of her chubby arms above the elbow. Then she looked across the table at Olive. Olive, who had been held up to her as a paragon of beauty, behavior, and success as long as she could remember. Why can't you hold yourself like Olive does? Why can't you stand correctly like Olive does? Why can't you speak prettily like Olive does? Why can't you make an effort thus? Valency's elfin eyes lost their mocking glitter and became pensive and sorrowful. You could not ignore or disdain Olive. It was quite impossible to deny that she was beautiful and effective 
and sometimes a little intelligent. Her mouth might be a trifle heavy. She might show her fine, white, regular teeth rather, rather too lavishly when she smiled. But when all was said and done, all of justified Uncle Benjamin summing up. A stunning girl. Yes, Valancy agreed in her heart. Olive was stunning. Rich, golden-brown hair, elaborately dressed, with a sparkling bandeau holding its glossy puffs in place. Large, bl large brilliant blue eyes and thick silken lashes. Face of rose and bare neck of snow rising above her gown. Great pearl bubbles in her ears. The blue-white diamond flame on her long, smooth, waxen finger with its rosy point of nail. Arms of marble gleaming through green chiffon and shadowy lace. Valancy felt suddenly thankful that her own scrawny arms were decently swathed in brown silk. Then she resumed her tabulation of Olive's charms. Tall, queenly, confident, everything that Valancy was not. Dimples, too, in cheeks and chin. <laughs> A woman with dimples always gets her own way thought Valancy in a recurring spasm of bitterness at the fate which had denied her even one dimple. Olive was a year younger than Valancy, though a stranger would have thought that there was at least ten years between them. But nobody ever dreaded old maidenhood for her. Olive had been surrounded by a crowd of eager bows since her early teens, just as her mirror was always surrounded by a fringe of cards, photographs, programs, and invitations. At 18, when she had graduated from Havergal College, Olive had been engaged to Will Desmond, layer in embryo. Will Desmond had died and Olive had mourned for him properly for two years. When she was 23, she had a hectic affair with Donald Jackson. But uncle, no. But aunt and Uncle Wellington disapproved of that, and in the end, Olive dutifully gave him up. Nobody in the Sterling clan, whatever outsiders might say, hinted that she did so because Donald himself was cooling off. However that might be, Olive's third venture met with everyone's approval. Cecil Price, or was it Cecil? Huh, Cecil, I think it's Cecil. Huh. Cecil or Cecil? What? Why am I questioning myself now? I've read this book like at least a gazillion times, and only now am I, is it Cecil or Cecil? Let's do Cecil. <clears throat> so I might say Cecil again. <laughs> okay. It's not it's not a proper magpie stream if I don't butcher someone's name. So let's go with Cecil. <clears throat> Cecil Price. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. Cecil Price was clever and handsome and one of the Port Lawrence Prices. Olive had been engaged to him for three years. He had just graduated in civil engineering and they were to be married as soon as he landed a contract. Olive's hope just was full to overflowing with exquisite things, and Olive had already confided to Valancy what her wedding dress was to be. Ivory silk draped with lace, white satin court ring, lined with pale green georgette, heirloom veil of Brussels lace. Valancy knew also, though Olive had not told her, that the bridesmaids were selected, and she was not among them. Valancy had, after a fashion, always been Olive's confidante, perhaps because she was the only girl in the connection who could not bore Olive with return confidences. Olive always told Valancy all the details of her love affair, of her love affairs, from the days when the little boys in school used to, quote-unquote, persecute her with love letters. Valancy could not comfort herself by thinking these affairs mythical. Olive really had them. Many men had gone mad over her besides the three fortunate ones. I don't know what the poor idiots see in me. That drives them to make such double idiots of themselves, Olive was wont to say. Valancy would have liked to say, I don't either. But truth and diplomacy both restrained her. She did know perfectly well. Olive Sterling was one of the girls about whom men do go mad just as indubitably as she. Valancy was one of the girls at whom no man ever looked twice. And yet, thought Valancy, summing her up with a new and merciless conclusiveness, 
She's like a dewless morning. There's something lacking. End of chapter. <laughs> okay. So that was a short introduction, introductory cha chapter. We have the cast. I think I forgot to include some people in my post-it notes, so... <laughs> I should put a picture of my stupid little post-it notes in um, Twitter after I'm done. You guys will laugh at them. <laughs> um, yeah, so isn't that, like, the worst? Like, yo, Olive is not gonna make... Like, I was like, yo, Olive is the kind of girl... That she just needs a balance to like adore, like she can just like flaunt everything she has. She's and then she also turns around and doesn't make her a bridesmaid. Like that's something that Valency has always wanted to be. I mean, what does it cost you to make your little cousin a bridesmaid? Like, come on, dude. Like, come on. Throw a girl a bone, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, our Katie had a... <laughs> our Katie Durrell uh, reacts to the stupid little joke about what herb is injurious to a young lady's beauty at time. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I know. Um, my brain was kind of like glitching a little. I'm like, how am I supposed to pronounce Cecil? Cecil, Cecil, Cecil. Mm-hmm. That's a representation for French. Okay. Well, since we're in Canada, and Canada has a lot of French-speaking people, we'll just go with Cecil. Um, <clears throat> yeah, poor Valency, not even a bridesmaid. All it costs is one dress. I know, but it's not like they're infinitely poor. I mean, that was never cons like a consideration. Like the other, the only other time she said that she might have been a. Uh, bridesmaid she was like i'm excited because that means i get to have a cute new dress like she didn't say like it's gonna be expensive and my mom will be no no it was just like i get to have a new dress but then that was a letdown and it's gonna happen again um i mean all this girl wants is a freaking dress all she has is that brown stuffy silk <laughs> now at least there are some pros to having a dress that covers your arms entirely uh how, that line about her own scrawny little arms were decently clad in silk because she was self-conscious when she saw that and she compared her her own physique to uh olives you know tall stately uh statuesque queenly and then we have scrawny little valency oh poor dear oh valency oh valency it's okay, Balancy. We love you. You are much beloved by us all. By the way, I'm going to be a bridesmaid this year. Um, I am debating about... I, I, the color is going to be Wisteria. So I know the color. I There's a website. Dude, like, I know... Okay, like... <sighs> bridal dresses are expensive, you guys. <laughs> like, $100 or more. Which, probably some people, they're like... Yeah, whatever i'm like yo I, i'm not gonna wear this dress ever again but okay i'll buy it it's like yeah being a bridesmaid is something else so the color for this wedding that i'm going to be at is wisteria purple so uh -huh, alexandria <laughs> i mean aaron's back shit um yeah aaron's back purple all right Anyway, enough about that. Let's continue on. <laughs> Wear white to the wedding magpies as Red Tempest. No! Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. Um, also, speaking of wearing white to the wedding, I just remembered I was watching this Netflix show that's absolutely hilarious. Guys, go check it out. It's called Dairy Girls. <laughs> and in it, there's a scene where um, it starts with a wedding, you know, and people are in a church. And this woman comes down the aisle and she's wearing white, like this beautiful, like decked out white dress with a matching hat. And she comes down the aisle and then she sits in the audience. And right behind her is like this young, far less under, like far underdressed young bride. Like, I'm like feeling so sorry for her. And she's crying because the woman in front of her, she arrived late to the wedding. And she took her seat by going down the central aisle during the time that the bride was supposed to go. 
<laughs> so ridiculous. Yeah, so never wear white to a to a wedding. Also, apparently never wear black. But my bestie in I went to my bestie's birth birthday wedding and I looked up the dress code because it was uh, a different a different culture than mine so i was like dress code dress code and it was black is very acceptable so i wore black to that wedding and it was great i saw other people wearing black i was like cool classy elegant i have plenty of black classy elegant dresses and i took my favorite one and i looked banger and i danced with the bride and it was amazing um yeah why can't we just wear black to weddings i mean we are mourning a stage of life you know our freedom and singlehood and whatnot Anyway, okay, uh, let's go. Let's continue on reading. Enough about this uh, small tangent. <clears throat> anyway, welcome to everybody who just joined us. I see a few people just joined. Maybe one person joined. I'll see you later. I'll talk to you guys later a little bit more. Okay, let's do this. <clears throat> Sip of water. Chapter 11. Meanwhile, the dinner in its earlier stages was dragging its slow length, well, its slow length along true to sterling form. The room was chilly, in spite of the calendar, and Aunt Alberta had the gas logs lighted. Everybody in the clan envied her those gas logs, except Balancey. Glorious open fires blazed in every room of her blue castle when autumnal nights were cool. But she would have frozen to death in it before she would have committed the sacrilege of a gas log. Uncle Herbert made it. Oh, Uncle Herbert made his hearty. Oh. <laughs> this is stupid. Uncle Herbert made his hearty perennial joke when he helped Aunt Wellington to the cold meat. Mary, will you have a little lamb? Aunt Mildred told the same old story of once finding a lost ring. In a turkey's crop. Uncle Benjamin told his favorite prosy tale of how he had once chased and punished a now famous man for stealing apples. Second cousin Jane described all her sufferings with an ulcerating tooth. Aunt Wellington admired the pattern of Aunt Alberta's silver teaspoons and lamented the, and lamented the fact that one of her own had been lost. It spoiled the set. I could never get it matched, and it was my wedding present for my dear old Matilda. Aunt Isabel thought the seasons were changing and couldn't imagine what had become of our good old-fashioned springs. Cousin Georgiana, as usual, discussed the last funeral and wondered audibly, which of us will be the next one to pass away? Cousin Georgiana could never say anything as blunt as die. Balancy thought she could tell her, but didn't. Cousin Gladys, likewise, as usual, had a grievance. Her visiting nephews had nipped all of the buds of her houseplants and chivied her brood of fancy chickens. Squeezed some of them actually to death, my dear. Boys will be boys, reminded Uncle Herbert tolerantly. But they needn't be rampaging, rampageous animals, retorted Cousin Gladys, looking around the table for appreciation of her wit. Everybody smiled except Balancy. Cousin Gladys remembered that. A few minutes later, when Ellen Hamilton was being discussed, Cousin Gladys spoke of her as one of those... <laughs> Cous Cousin Gladys spoke of her as one of those shy, plain girls who can't get husbands. And glanced significantly at Valency. Uncle James thought the conversation was sagging too long... Was, okay, sorry. Uncle James thought the conversation was sagging to a rather low point, uh, lo rather low plane of personal gossip. He tried to elevate it by starting an abstract discussion on the greatest happiness. Everyone was asked to everyone was asked to state his or her idea of the greatest happiness. Aunt Mildred thought the greatest happiness for a woman was to be a loving and beloved wife and mother. Aunt Wellington, <laughs> sorry, Aunt Wellington thought it would be to travel in Europe. 
Olive thought it would be to be a great singer like Tetrazzini. Cousin Gladys remarked mournfully that her greatest happiness would be to be free, absolutely free, from neuritis. Cousin Georgiana's greatest happiness would be to have her dear dead brother Richard Black. Aunt Alberta remarked vaguely that the greatest happiness was to be found in the poetry of life and hastily gave some directions to her maid to prevent anyone asking her what she meant. Mrs. Frederick said the greatest happiness was to spend your life in loving service for others. And Cousin Stickles and Aunt Isabel agreed with her. Aunt Isabel with a resentful air, as if she thought Mrs. Frederick had taken the wind out of her sails by saying it first. We are all too prone, continued Mrs. Frederick, determined not to lose so good an opportunity, to live in selfishness, worldliness, and sin. The other women all felt rebuked for their low ideals. Uncle James had a conviction that the conversation had been uplifted with a vengeance. The greatest happiness, said Valancy suddenly and distinctly, is to sneeze when you want to. Everybody stared. Nobody felt it safe to say anything. Was Valancy trying to be funny? It was incredible. Mrs. Frederick, who had been breathing easier since the dinner had progressed so far without any outbreak on the part of Valancy, began to tremble again. But she deemed it the part of prudence to say nothing. Uncle Benjamin was not so prudent. He rashly rushed in where Mrs. Frederick feared to tread. Doss, he chuckled, what is the difference between a young girl and an old maid? One is happy and careless and the other is happy and hairless said Valancy. You have asked that riddle at least 50 times in my recollection, Uncle Ben. Why don't you hunt up some new riddles? If riddle, you must. That is such a fatal mistake to be funny if you don't succeed. No, <laughs> to try to be funny if you don't succeed. Uncle Benjamin stared foolishly. Never in his life had he, Benjamin Sterling of Sterling and Frost, been spoken to so, and by Valancy of all people. He looked feebly around the table to see what the others thought of it. Everybody was looking rather blank. Poor Mrs. Frederick had shut her eyes, and her lips moved tremblingly, as if she were praying. Perhaps she was. The situation was so unprecedented that nobody knew how to meet it. Valancy went on calmly eating her salad, as if nothing out of the unusual, as if nothing out of the usual had occurred. Aunt Alberta, to save the dinner, plunged into an account of how a dog had bitten her recently. Uncle James, to back her up, asked where the dog had bitten her. Just a little below the Catholic Church, said Aunt Alberta. At that point, Valancy laughed. Nobody else laughed. What was there to laugh at? <laughs> Is that a vital part? asked Valancy. What do you mean? said bewildered Aunt Alberta. And Mrs. Frederick was almost driven to believe that she had served God all her years for naught. Aunt Isabel concluded that it was up to her to suppress Valancy. Thus, you are horribly thin. You are all corners. Do you ever try to fatten up a little? No. Valancy was not asking quarter or giving it. But I can tell you where you can find a beauty parlor in Port Lawrence. But it can reduce the number of your chins. Valancy! The protest was wrung from Mrs. Frederick. She meant her tone to be stately and majestic as usual, but it sounded more like an imploring whine, and she did not say thus. She's feverish, said Cousin Stickles to Uncle Benjamin in an agonized whisper. We thought she'd seem feverish for several days. She's gone dippy in my opinion, growled Uncle Benjamin. If not, she ought to be spanked. Yes, spanked. You can't spank her? Cousin Stickles was much agitated. She's 29 years old. So there's that advantage at least in being 29, said Valancy, whose ears had caught this aside. Thus, said Uncle Benjamin, when I am dead, you may say what you please. As long as I'm alive, I demand to be treated with respect. Oh, but you know, we're all dead, said Valancy. The whole Sterling clan. Some of us are buried, and some of us aren't. Yet, yeah, that is the only difference. 
Doss, said Uncle Benjamin, thinking it might cow Valency. Do you remember the time you stole the raspberry jam? Valency flushed scarlet. With suppressed laughter, not shame. She had been sure Uncle Benjamin would drag that jam in somehow. Of course I do, she said. It was good jam. I've always been sorry I hadn't time to eat more of it before you found me. <gasps> oh, look at Aunt Isabel's profile on the wall. Did you ever see anything so funny? Everybody looked, including Aunt Isabel herself, which, of course, destroyed it. Uncle Herbert said kindly, I, I wouldn't eat any more if I were you, Doss. It isn't that I grudge it, but don't you think it would be better for yourself? Your, your stomach seems a little out of order. Oh, don't worry about my stomach, old dear. It's all right. I'm going to keep right on eating. It is so seldom I get the chance of a satisfying meal. It was the first time anyone had ever been called old dear in Deerwood. The Sterlings thought Valancy had invented the phrase, and they were afraid of her from that moment. There was something so uncanny about such an expression. But in poor Mrs. Frederick's opinion, the reference to a satisfying meal was the worst thing Valancy had said yet. Valancy had always been a disappointment to her. Now she was a disgrace. She thought she would have to get up and go away from the table, yet she dared not leave Valancy there. Aunt Alberta's maid came in to remove the salad plates and bring in the dessert. It was a welcome diversion. Everybody brightened up with a determination to ignore Valancy and talk as if she wasn't there. Uncle Benjamin mentioned Barney Sneath. Eventually, somebody did mention Barney Sneath at every sterling function, Valancy reflected. Whatever he was, he was an individual that could not be ignored. She resigned herself to listen. There was a subtle fascination in the subject for her, though she had not yet faced this fact. She could feel her pulses beating to her fingertips. Oh, Valancy, I forgot about this line. Oh my, Valancy. <laughs> Of course they all abused him. Nobody ever had a good word to say of Valancy's knave. All the old wild tales were canvassed. The defaulting cashier counterfeit. <laughs> oh my god, I can't. Okay, let me try this. The defaulting cashier counterfeiter infidel murderer in hiding. Legends were, trash were thrashed out. Uncle Wellington was very indignant that such a creature should be allowed to exist at all in the neighborhood of Deerwood. He didn't know what the police at Port Lawrence were thinking of. Everybody would be murdered in their beds some night. It was a shame that he would be allowed to be at large after all that he had done. What has he done? asked Valancy suddenly. Uncle Wellington stared at her, forgetting that she was to be ignored. <clears throat> done, done, he's done everything. What has he done? What do you know he has done? You're always running him down. And has he an... And what has ever been proved against him? I don't argue with women, um, said Uncle Ben. Oh. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't argue with women, said Uncle Wellington, and I don't need proof. When a man hides himself up there in an island in Muskoka, year in and year out, nobody can find out where he came from or how he lives or what he does there. That is proof enough. Find a mystery and you'll find a crime. The very idea of a man named Snaith, said second cousin Sarah. Why, the name itself is enough to condemn him. Oh, that's cousin Sarah. That's a, that's a different word. It's a different voice. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm going to redo cousin Sarah. <laughs> the very idea of a man named Snaith, said second cousin Sarah. Why, the name itself is enough to condemn him. I wouldn't like to meet him in a dark lane shivered cousin georgiana what do you suppose he would do to you asked valancy murder me said cousin georgiana solemnly just for the fun of it suggested valancy exactly said cousin georgiana unsuspiciously when there is so much smoke there must be some fire i was afraid he was a criminal when he uh, i was afraid he was a criminal when he came here first i felt he had something to hide I am not often mistaken in my intuitions. Criminal! Of course he's a criminal, said Uncle Wellington. 
Nobody doubts it. He glared at Valency. Why? They say he served a term in the penitentiary for embezzlement. I don't doubt it. And they say he's in with that gang that are perpetrating all those bank robberies around the country. Who say? asked Valency. Uncle Wellington nodded his ugly forehead at her. What had got into this confounded girl anyway? He ignored the question. He has the identical look of a jailbird, snapped Uncle Benjamin. I noticed it the first time I saw him. A fellow by the hand of nature marked, quoted and signed to do a deed of crime. No, a deed of shame. The oh, that was Uncle James. Dang it, Uncle James, get out of here. I'm trying to do Benjamin's voice. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's do that again. A fellow by the hand of nature marked, quoted and signed to do a deed of shame, declaimed Uncle James. He looked enormously pleased over managing to work that quotation in at last. He had been waiting all his life for the chance. One of his eyebrows is an arch and the other is a triangle, said Valency. Is that why you think him so villainous? Uncle James lifted his eyebrows. Generally, when Uncle James lifted his eyebrows, the world came to an end. This time, it continued to function. How do you know about his eyebrows so well, Doss? asked Olive, a trifle maliciously. Such a remark should have cowed Valency with confusion two weeks ago, and Olive knew it. And Olive knew it. <laughs> yes, how? demanded Aunt Wellington. I've seen him twice, and I looked at him closely, said Valency composedly. I thought his face the most interesting one I ever saw. There is no doubt there is something fishy in the creature's past life, said Olive, who began to think she was decidedly out of the conversation, which had centered so amazingly about Valency, around Valency. But he can hardly be guilty of everything he's accused of, you know. Valency felt annoyed with Olive. Why should she speak up? In, uh, <laughs> why should she speak up in even with this what why should she speak up in even this qualified defense of, huh? hmm. strangely worded why should she speak up in even this qualified deference of barney sneath defense of barney sneath what had she to do with him for that matter what had valency Valency did not ask herself this question. They say he keeps a dozens of they say he keeps dozens of cats in that hunt up back in Mistowis, said second cousin Sarah Taylor by way of appearing not entirely ignorant of him. Cats. It sounded quite alluring to Valency in the plural. She pictured an island in Muskoka hunted by cats. Pussies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm so I am so immature for laughing here. <laughs> <clears throat> she pictured an island in Muskoka hunted by kitties. That alone shows <laughs> my future self is gonna be cringing at me at this part, but mm. yes. I think I've watched too much anime now and my brain has rotted and too much TV. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that alone sounds. Wait, wait, um, Isabel. Okay, <clears throat> cats. It sounded quite alluring to Valency in the plural. She pictured an island in Muskoka hunted by pussies. That alone shows there's something wrong with him, decreed Aunt Isabel. People who don't like cats, said Valency, attacking her dessert with a relish, always seem to think that there is some particular virtue in not liking them. The man hasn't a friend except Roaring Abel, said Uncle Wellington, and if Roaring Abel had been kept away from him as everybody else said, it would have been better for, for some members of his family. Uncle Wellington Another lame conclusion was due to a marital glance from Aunt Wellington, reminding him of what he had almost forgotten, that there were girls at the table. If you mean, said Valency passionately, that Barney Sneath is the father of Cecil, oh, Cecily? 
that Barney Sneath is the father of Cecily Gay's child. He isn't. It's a wicked lie. In spite of her indignation, Valancy was hugely amused at the expression of the faces around the festal table. She had not seen anything like it since the day, 17 years ago, when at Cousin Gladys's thimble party, they had discovered that she had got something in her head at school. Lies in her head. Valancy was done with euphemisms. Poor Mrs. Frederick was almost in a state of collapse. She had believed, or pretended to believe, that Valancy still supposed that children were found in parsley bed. Hush, hush, implored Cousin Stickles. I don't mean to hush, said Valancy perversely. I've hush hushed all my life. I'll scream if I want to. I'll scream if I want to. Don't make me want to. And stop talking nonsense about Barney Sneath. Valancy didn't exactly understand her own indignation. What did Barney Sneath's imputed crimes and misdemeanors matter to her? And why, out of them all, did it seem most intolerable that he should have been poor, pitiful little Cecily Gay's false lover? For it did seem intolerable to her. She did not mind when they called him a thief and a counterfeiter and a jailbird, but she could not endure to think that he had loved and ruined Cecily Gay. She recalled his face on the two occasions of their chance, of their chance meetings. His twisted... Enigmatic, engaging smile, his twinkle, his thin, sensitive, almost ascetic lips, his general air of frank daredeviltry. A man with such a smile and lips might have murdered or stolen, but he could not have betrayed. She suddenly hated everyone who said it or believed it of him. <clears throat> when I was a young girl... I never thought or spoke about such matters, Doss, said Aunt Wellington crushingly. But I'm not a young girl, retorted Valancy, uncrushed. Aren't you always rubbing that into me? <clears throat> You're all evil-minded, senseless gossips. Can't you leave poor Sissy Gay alone? She's dying. Whatever she did, God or the devil has punished her enough for it. You needn't take a hand, too. As for Barney Sneath, the only crime he has been guilty of is leaving to him... Is, hmm is living to himself and minding his own business. He can, it seems, get along without you, which is an unpardonable sin, of course, in your little snobocracy. Valancy coined that concluding word suddenly and felt that it was an inspiration. That was exactly what they were, and, none, and not one of them was fit to mend another. Valancy, your poor father would turn over in his grave if he could hear you said Mrs. Frederick. I dare say he would like that for a change, said Valancy brazenly. Doss, said Uncle James heavily, the Ten Commandments are fairly up to date still, especially the Fifth. Have you forgotten that? No, said Valancy, but I thought you had, especially the Ninth. Have you ever thought, Uncle James, how dull life would be without the Ten Commandments? It is only when things are forbidden that they become fascinating. But her excitement had been too much for her. She knew by certain unmistakable warnings that one of her attacks of pain was coming on. They must not find her there. She rose from her chair. I am going home now. I only came for dinner. It was very good, Aunt Alberta, although your salad dressing is not salt enough, and a dash of cayenne would improve it. None of the others... None of the... <laughs> none of the... Fa ah, flabbergasted. Okay. None of the flabbergasted silver wedding guests could think of anything to say until the lawn gate clanked behind Valancy in the dusk. Then, She's feverish! I've said it right along! She was feverish! moaned Cousin Stickles. Uncle Benjamin pushed his pudgy left hand fiercely with his... Oh, Uncle Benjamin punished his pudgy left hand fiercely with his pudgy right. She's dippy. I tell you, she's gone dippy, he snorted angrily. That's all there is about it. Clean dippy. Oh, Benjamin, said Cousin Georgiana soothingly, don't condemn her too rashly. We must remember what dear old Shakespeare says, that charity thinketh no evil. Charity puppycock. <laughs> charity puppycock, said Uncle Benjamin. I've never heard a young woman talk such stuff in my life as she just did. 
talking about things she ought to be ashamed to think of, much less mention blaspheming, insulting us. What she wants is a generous dose of spankweed, and I'd like to be the one to administer. Ugh. Uncle Benjamin. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <clears throat> <laughs> Uncle Benjamin. <laughs> and I'd like to be the one administering it. Ah. And I'd like to be the one to administer it. <sighs> Uncle Benjamin gulped down the half of a scalding cup of coffee. Do you suppose that the mums could work on a person that way? Wailed Cousin Stickles. I opened an umbrella in the house yesterday, sniffed Cousin Georgiana. I knew it be token to some misfortune. Have you tried to find out if she has a temperature? asked Cousin Mildred. She wouldn't let Amelia put the thermometer under her tongue, whimpered Cousin Stickles. Mrs. Frederick was openly in tears. All her defenses were down. <laughs> I must tell you. <clears throat> Is that too hard to understand? Okay, let's do it again. I must tell you, she sobbed, that Valency has been acting very strangely for over two weeks now. She hasn't been a bit like herself. Christine could tell you. I have hoped against hope that it was only one of her colds coming on. But it is, it must be something worse. This is bringing on my neuritis again, said Cousin Gladys, putting her hand to her head. Is that Cousin Gladys? Oh no, this is a different voice. <clears throat> this is bringing one of my... Oh, sheesh, I'm sorry, you guys. This is bringing on my neuritis again, said Cousin Gladys, putting her hand, her hand to her head. Don't cry, Amelia, said Herbert kindly, pulling nervously at his spiky gray hair. He hated family ructions. Ructions. Family ructions. Very inconsiderate of Doss to start one at his silver wedding. Who could have supposed she had it in her? You'll have to take her to a doctor. This may be only a, uh, uh, a brainstorm. There are such things as brainstorms nowadays, aren't there? I suggested consulting a doctor to her yesterday, moaned Mrs. Frederick, and she said she wouldn't go to a doctor, wouldn't? Oh, surely I have had trouble enough. And she won't take Redfern's bitters, said Cousin Stickles, or anything, said Mrs. Frederick. And she's determined to go to the Presbyterian Church, said Cousin Stickles, repressing, however, to her credit, be it said, the story of the banister. That proves she's tippy, growled Uncle Benjamin. I noticed something strange about her the minute she came in today. I noticed it before today. Uncle Benjamin was thinking of M-I-R-A-Z-H, Mirage. Everything she, um, everything she said today showed an unbalanced mind. That question was it a vital part. Was there any sense at all in that remark? None whatever. There never was anything like that in the Sterlings. It must be from the ones, Boris. Poor Mrs. Frederick was too crushed to be indignant. I never heard of anything like that in the ones, Boris, she sobbed. Your father was odd enough. Poor Pa was... Peculiar, admitted Mrs. Frederick tearfully, but his mind was never affected. He talked all his life exactly as well as he did today, retorted Uncle Benjamin, and he believed he was his own great-great-grandfather born over again. I've heard him say it. Don't tell me that a man who believed a thing like that was ever in his right senses. Come, come, Amelia, stop sniffling. Of course, Doss has made a terrible exhibition of herself today, but she's not responsible. Old maids are apt to fly off a tangent like that. If she had been married when she should have... Ah, uh, wait. If she should have been... Ah! If she had been married when she should have been, she wouldn't have got like this. Nobody wanted to marry her, said Mrs. Frederick, who felt that somehow Uncle Benjamin was blaming her. Well, 
Fortunately, there's no outsider here, Uncle said, uh, snapped Uncle Benjamin. Oh, shoot. Hold on. <clears throat> Hold on a second. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> Let me get a little sip of water. <clears throat> Nobody wanted to marry her, said Mrs. Frederick, who felt that somehow Uncle Benjamin was blaming her. Well, fortunately, there's no outsider here, snapped Uncle Benjamin. We may keep it in the family yet. I'll take her over to see Dr. Marsh tomorrow. I know how to deal with pig-headed people. Won't that be best, James? We must have medical advice, certainly, agreed Uncle James. Well, that's settled. In the meantime, Amelia, act as, act as if nothing had happened and keep an eye on her. Don't let her be alone. Above all, don't let her sleep alone. We knew whimpers from Mrs. Frederick. I can't help it. Not before last, I suggested she'd better have Christine sleep with her. She positively refused and her door oh you don't know how she's changed she won't work at least she won't sew she does her usual housework of course but she wouldn't sweep the parlor yesterday morning though we always sweep it on thursdays she said she'd wait until it was dirty would you rather sweep a dirty room than a clean one i asked her she said of course i'd see something for my labor then think of it uncle benjamin out of it. The jar of potpourri, Cousin Stickles pronounced it as it was spelled. Oh, potpourri. <laughs> the jar of potpourri, Cousin Stickles pronounced it as she spelled it, has disappeared from her room. I found the pieces in the next lot. She won't tell us what's happened to it. I should never have dreamed it of Doss, said Uncle Herbert. She was always, she always seemed such a quiet, sensible girl. A bit backward, but sensible. The only thing you can be sure of in this world is a, multipl is a multiplication table, said Uncle James, feeling cleverer than ever. Well, let's cheer up, suggested Uncle Benjamin. Why are chorus girls like fine stock racers? Why? asked Cousin Stickle, since it had to be asked. And Valancy wasn't there to ask it. I like to exhibit calves, <laughs> chuckled Uncle Benjamin. Cousin Stickles thought Uncle Benjamin a little indelicate, before Olive too, but then he was a man. Uncle Herbert was thinking that things were rather dull now that Doss had gone. End of chapter. Okay. <laughs> That was by, har by far one of the hardest chapters to read <laughs> because I think I messed up a few times. <laughs> there's such... Oh my gosh, you guys. I know there's such people and they can be... I don't know, but I, I just love how she wrote them, their dialogues, their little... <laughs> I don't know. I, I love this chapter these two chapters i hope you guys did as well i wonder if i can read a little bit more it's one o'clock we started at noon that's an hour what do you guys think i think it's i can do a little bit more because the next one is just valency as far as i know um let's see yeah i think it's it's a shorter chapter it's very short actually <laughs> yeah there's the next two chapters are very short i may read it and then i'll pick up later um yeah I'll, I'll do the one after that later so let's see uh let me go back up to the stuff oh i lost a few i lost a few stuff okay so let me let me read your comments dress code school uniforms at a wedding be weird <laughs> Well, that's different. Like, I remember I used to go to a Christian school 
uh, at some point in my life and they had these weird dress codes um but even weddings do have dress codes um definitely never wear white and depending on the culture don't wear black <laughs> uh yeah there's other stuff what are some dress codes from your part of the world that you know of or not even dress codes like just customs that are except like i know some people like wear like colors to match the wedding theme or whatnot i don't know i've never been to one of those fancy parties let me know um magpie talk to the hand i'm reading about balancey oh <laughs> yeah i had to mention a little bit of uh, bookworm sorry um let's see grandpa jokes yes yes we did have quite a bit of grandpa jokes and uncle benjamin did leave us with a final little gem <laughs> why are what was it what was the question hold on a sec let me go back to it it was so silly <laughs> why are chorus girls like fine stock racers <laughs> because they like to exhibit calves <laughs> that was so bad uh, okay <clears throat> Red Tempest says, Uncle Benjamin is basically, you can dance on my grave when I die, but give me respect as while I live. Yes. Um, though I would, I would, I don't think he would like it if Valency danced on his grave. But you know what? He has one way to, to have Valency respect him after he dies is if he just remembers her in his will. She will be forever grateful to him. Um, of course, he doesn't know that she's about to die and therefore she no longer has to care about his will. But, you know, my man, if you want to be loved and respected, just leave the girl all your money. Go ahead. I wish somebody would leave me their money. <laughs> um, our kitty dress is, it remi reminds me of my family meeting full of stupid declarations. Oh, yes. When I was a kid, it was so annoying to sit through family meet family dinners. I well, I had a large family back in my old country. Um, oh my gosh, it was so boring. Uh, but so yeah, as an adult now, I have the luxury of being able to be like, bye bye. Like, here's here's the technique that I have found and it works. I go in early to help set up, warm up, serve, and then while the and, and then I eat and then I leave. Because I don't want to be stuck with like all the after dinner shenanigans and the cleanup and stuff. Like I will be your girl to go help you set up. I will even cook in the kitchen and whatnot. And then I will just make a quick and quiet, discreet exit when I feel like I need to go. Like my social battery is exhausted because as a introvert, introvert, I get exhausted really easily. And my social battery just goes out the window the moment I go to one of these functions. So yeah that's how you do it in early help set up eat leave that way you at least made a good impression on the host and they're like oh yeah she helped me cook she brought some food she she set this up beautifully and she played with the dogs and talked to the children played a few games and then left yep that's how you do it i'll, I'll also always bring something sweet and or flowers that's how you get along with the world <laughs> all right let's see who else release the gremlin valency right she's such a gremlin as well i love it i'm glad that you guys are enjoying valency's shenanigans and yes so many uncles i know i i have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven post-its on uncles and aunts and how i'm supposed to voice them <laughs> i still struggled um yeah, I would have loved it if it had been a smaller party, but then again, you wouldn't get such precious lines as, um, you know, Aunt Isabel saying things and Aunt Alberta and her double chins and I don't know what. <laughs> um, let's see. Old people arguing. Uh, worst moment of the year. Was that what? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I had to, I had to, I broke down. I'm sorry about that. Um. Uh, Red Tempest says, I'll be listening in background while I cut up a pineapple. I hope you enjoy your pineapple. Um, <laughs> Valency throwing cooking tips as insults and I love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it was good. But your salad dressing needed help. And 
bring some dash of, a dash of cayenne. Hey, that means that our girl knows how to cook. I'm sure she has to do a lot of the cooking at home. <laughs> uh, Red Tempa says, love the voice, lol. I hope that you enjoy it. I had lots of fun with these. I am gonna, I am doing a full on like proper recording of this. So I think I'm gonna go back to fix the voices because I think I, I mixed them up. Um, yeah, I am going to clean all of these up and then upload them to YouTube so you can listen to them in the background at any time without my chatter in between. But I don't know, I just, I just, I like these lives because it's fun. You can get, you can get me breaking down because I can't say the word pussy <laughs> or some other such thing. Um, yeah, uh, let's see what else. Love this, love the sweeping story. Arguing over sweeping when clean and dirty reminds me of what I said as a kid, right? Um, it's just like, yeah, I would rather clean up when it's dirty. I mean, I get it, but you also don't want to like let it accumulate too much. But I mean, a week won't kill her. Um, also, Red Tempest points out that uh, that could be a new Hartmut voice, Old Man Hartmut. Probably that's Uncle Benjamin's voice, uh, or is that Uncle Herbert's voice? They have a different sound. Uncle Herbert is more like, like Uncle Herbert, like more airily. He's more like a. I kind of imagine him like as somebody who like is being could easily topple if a strong wind comes his way. So he's kind of like wispy. His voice is like Valency. And then Uncle Benjamin is more ponderous, like I don't know, like grumpy old man, like like a grumpy man, you know, kind of feeble because he's old but still has like a little bit of a low vocal fry sometimes. I'm trying to get the vocal fry properly, but it's sometimes hard. Um, yeah. So much happened in this chapter. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do one more chapter. It's not too long. It's just basically Valency's conclusion after this. We get her side of the story. Um, oh. You went to a local school, Patrick, uh, in San Jose, forbade us to wear red or blue. Why? At a wedding or at just a school? School? Why would they do that? Was it like your rival's high school colors or what? Hmm. Also, our Katie Durrell says, for a wedding, you wear smart clothing. Yeah, makes sense. At one of my family's weddings, a cousin wore a t-shirt, says Red Tempest and jeans, so yeah. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, I'm sure that Bride did not appreciate that. Now, Crusher says, I feel like this book is a cry of for help from the author. I hope she wasn't too lonely growing up. Yeah, so here's the thing, you guys. Ella Montgomery was basically... Okay, so Anna Green Gables, if you guys haven't read it, it's kind of like her story, but made prettily. She was brought up by an elderly couple. Like, I, I think it was family related, but she was also an orphan. And so she had she had to she had some struggles growing up. Um, she did end up marrying a um, a minister. And so so she was and she was an author. So she was always, always, always under the spotlight, always being like scrutinized because first off as an author she was a public figure she was beloved in the world of literature but she she was still a woman of her time she couldn't go crazy i mean this is as wild as it gets like talking about illegitimate children that was considered like wow taboo right back in her day especially she as a minister's wife her husband also um, he had his own mental issues. He, she struggled, you know, because back in the day they didn't have treatment for depressions and stuff like that. There was some, some, he had some issues and stuff. So her personal life was difficult. She did manage to become a very successful writer and very acclaimed. She was able to travel the world. She was very, very, very well known. So she did get her recognition uh, during her time, but it's just... I do feel like when I go and revisit her story, like there she was, there was a bit of strain in her, in her life as trying to be like a woman. Like she was, you could feel that like she was smarting under the pressure of being a wife, a mother, a pastor's wife, um, just being under under constant scrutiny. I think this is definitely reflective of that. Like she's just, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so yeah, that's a good point, Crusher. I do, I do um, recommend you guys check out some of some more of her work. It's really good, and some of her times. Unfortunately, towards the end, it was a little bit difficult. She had a rough time, especially with World War II. Um, that was that was a very dark period of her life. So yeah. Um, let's see. Arcade Durrell says the actual meal can take a full afternoon. I know that's why I don't like those long, long things. Like, so okay, so I I do a lot of since I'm I have like a lot of community friends and stuff like that from church and stuff. Like, we do parties and stuff all the time. Um, but I always take refuge in the setup crew. I'm always, if I can, if I can just be like not sitting and socializing, I will go in the kitchen, cut up fruit, <laughs> do something in the kitchen. Or if it's like a function at, a, at the big fellowship hall, I will be at the AV room and help do sound and projection and just hide away in the AV room and just take my food there and eat it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am that girl. I am that introvert girl um yeah so always always try to find ways to get away from these functions i'm glad i can just bounce uh, I, can, I have finally mastered the fine art of leaving a social function without offending the hosts uh, it took me a long time to get it but you can also acquire such a skill with practice red tempa says my school uniforms were navy blue white black colored shirts and navy blue khaki black pants so that's why you weren't able oh, oh no this is this was patrick all right so my school uniform when i when i wore a uniform was um like you know like um not quite plaid it was blue and green and yellow kind of like tartan you know how you have like crisscrossy it was it was that color and white shirt but mostly it was navy blue so yeah uh good to see you hey here's plamen happy to see you plamen all the other <laughs> discord gang happy to see you all uh plamen says i can't think of any dress code situations in my entire life lucky you <laughs> patrick says speaking about bookworm when we're going to discuss the light novel at some point today uh yeah later in the afternoon sorry i I wasn't able to schedule it, but yes, later on in the afternoon over at the Discord, we'll we'll read some more and then we'll do it on Tuesday again. All right. Uh, Patrick Elsie calling somebody a wussy. I don't know who you're calling. I hope it's not me. Uh, I hope it's nobody else here. Nobody here is a wussy. <laughs> All right. Oh, gang colors. OK, so the red, the blue and the things were gang colors. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. Oh, the bride was his sister? The one, the, the jeans guy? Oh, shoot. That is wrong. That's so mean. Oh, no. Well, her wedding pictures were messed up. <gasps> what? Why didn't somebody tell him? Oh, no, no, no. That's, that's messed up. Oh, uh, well. Clement does uh, clarify, I wore normal pants and a shirt for my sister's wedding. I wore the same shirt that I wore for my sister's wedding today to drink with friends in the park. Okay, so I'm imagining it's like a casual button-down or like at least a button-down shirt that's nice, maybe? Maybe you just dress nicely all the time so you never have to worry about dress code. I mean, there, I know people who every day they get up and they wear they choose to wear business casual and that's all the more power to them i can't i won't i wear leggings and an oversized t-shirt and sneakers and if not sneakers then jeans and boots and a jacket or something i don't know that's that's basically my in and out and then when i go to church it's boots and a you know a sundress and a cardigan on top it's the uniform <laughs> all right <clears throat> uh the socializing shirt yes no it was on the top of my dresser so i just grabbed the one on top it must be nice to have absolutely no qualms about what you're gonna wear girls we always overthink things which is why i have developed a uniform for my daily life i i already told you like i have like Casual leggings, going out, jeans, and going to church, dress with boots. 
because I hate high heels. Maybe I wore wedges or sandals in the summer, but most of the time, autumn and winter, I'm wearing boots. Nice boots, but they're, yeah. But it's gonna go and uh, rule the world. <laughs> okay, you guys, Patrick. I just received a notification on my phone. Patrick, by the way, is one of my Discord members, so he gets the uh, he gets to direct message me whenever he wants. And just clarified, says was calling you wussy because he couldn't say pussy. Just thought it was a funny way to clean up the word. <laughs> yes, yes. Thanks for your direct message. <laughs> I feel like. I feel like because there's so few of us here that I'm just being like really like just laid back. I'm doing stuff I would never do in like read-alongs or like chit chats where like there's like a hundred people watching. But because this is just a few of us, yeah, maybe like 10 or maybe 12 maximum watching right now or six or maybe two. Like I'm just like, whatever. <laughs> All right, let's let's continue on. Final chapter. Enough nonsense, you guys. No more nonsense. Too much nonsense today. Let's finish the Valency, this Valency chapter, which I actually do like, and I feel it's a perfect way to end today's live read. Balancey hurried home. <clears throat> Balancey hurried home. Oh, shoot. Hold on a sec. There we go. Balancey hurried home through the faint blue twilight. Hurried too fast, perhaps. The attack she had when she thankfully reached the shelter of her own room was the worst yet. It was really very bad. She might die in one of those spells. It would be dreadful to die in such pain. Perhaps, perhaps this was death. Valancy felt pitifully alone. When she could think at all, she wondered what it would be like to have, one, to have someone with her who could sympathize. Someone who would, ah, someone who really cared, just to hold her hand tight, if nothing else. Someone just to say, yes, I know, it's dreadful. Be brave, you'll soon be better. Not someone merely fussy and alarmed. Not her mother or cousin Stickles. Why did the thought of Barney Snaith come into her mind? Why did she suddenly feel, in the midst of this hideous loneliness of pain, that he would be sympathetic, sorry for anyone that was suffering? Why did he seem to her like an old, well-known friend? Was it because he had been? Was it because she had been defending him, standing up to her family for him? She was so bad at first that she could not even get herself a dose of Dr. Trent's, uh, Dr. Trent's prescription. But eventually she managed it, and soon after relief came. The pain left her and she lay on her bed, spent, exhausted, in a cold perspiration. Oh, that had been horrible. She could not endure many more attacks like that. One didn't mind dying if death could be instant and painless, but to be hurt so in dying. Suddenly she found herself laughing. That dinner had been fun, and it had all been so simple. She had merely said the things she always thought. Their faces, oh, their faces. Uncle Benjamin, poor, flabbergasted Uncle Benjamin. Valancy felt quite sure he would make a new will that very night. Olive would get Valancy's share of his fat hoard. Olive had always got Valancy's share of everything. Remember the dust pile. To laugh at her clan as she had always wanted to laugh was all the satisfaction she could get out of life now. But she thought it was rather pitiful that it should be so. Might she not pity herself a little when nobody else did? Valancy got up and went to her window. The moist, beautiful wind blowing across groves of young-leafed wild trees touched her face with the caress of a wise, tender old friend. The Lombardies in Mrs. Tre Mrs. Treadgold's lawn off to the left, Valancy could just see them between the stable and the old carriage shop, where in dark purple silhouette, against the clear sky, 
and there was a milk-white pulsating star just above one of them, like a living pearl and a silver-green lake. Far beyond the station were the shadowy, purple-hooded woods around Lake Mistawas. A white, filmy mist hung over them, and just above it was a faint, young crescent. Valency looked at it over her thin left shoulder. I wish, she said whimsically, that I may have one little dust pile before I die. End of chapter. All right, my lovelies, that is it for today. Um, let me know what you guys thought about this. I, I don't know, like, like what she says, like it was super fun to kind of make, make fun of her people, laugh at them, at their little foibles and quirks. And, but it's true, like that's all she can get out of life. Just, you know, live her life and who cares what everybody thinks. It, it's fun in the moment, but when it comes down to it, it's rather pathetic. Like really, that's all she has left is the satisfaction of, showing you know showing her family what she can do and having them be afraid of her or just be absolutely flabbergasted by what she says there's there's little satisfaction in that when you when you think about it um she uh, what else are you supposed to do especially when she says like when she's in pain and when she's really suffering and going through her heart attack she's alone there's absolutely nobody there for her and not because she doesn't have a family she does have one but none of them would be the kind to just hold her hand and not try to fix her not try to preach to her there's nobody there's no kindred spirit that will just be there for her without lecturing without judgment and nobody that she can trust uh with being vulnerable to um so that's that kind of that kind of puts all of this into perspective. So we have Balancy. She's lived a life very downtrodden. She knows she's going to die. She goes wild. She goes gremlin mode. But in the end, all she just wants is, you know, she's still like saying like, yeah, that was fun. But I still would like so much more than just this. So I don't know. Uh, Balan I mean, <laughs> Barney Snaith came to her in her thoughts and we've heard a lot about Barney Snaith now and whatnot and even the book says that she herself hasn't admitted why she is so outraged that people like badmouth him and especially why she was so angry when people were uh, accusing him of being Cecily Gay's um, lover who got her pregnant and then like left her um, you know so that's that's what people so she hasn't yet faced owned up or faced up to the fact that she has some something there's something there we'll see if something happens or if he comes into the book and whatnot i mean you you can bet that there's something gonna happen but i'm not gonna tell you i'm not telling you you guys have to read this book yourselves or join me for the next couple of live reads i hope you enjoy them i've had so much fun you guys reading this with you guys um it's just a few of us i don't care i'm just doing this because i love this book so much you guys i love it so much and it's such a pleasure to share it with you guys um <laughs> so yes um it is the end of today's read along i had a blast thank you so much for uh for being with me on the chat all of you guys uh <laughs> making me laugh you guys are the best um we're talking about dog names from bookworm in discord today okay i didn't know that was on the agenda but okay yeah red tempest says uh poor valency she needs a lutz i know she needs a lutz she needs somebody to hold her hand when she's being taken in by the devouring hall huh? yeah so anyway I uh Plamen says I don't know if my mind is brainwashed from modern stories but I think and I hope the diagnosis is false and Valency will survive well we'll see we will see I mean everybody has though all kinds of like theories and they're super fun to read uh, especially because I know how the book ends and stuff so keep keep them coming any theories you have by all means share them I will read them I cannot confirm or deny 
um, share them in the comments and I will read them and then we will go back to them uh, when the book is over. <laughs> All right, darlings, I will see you on the next read along. I'm going to try to do another one for either Monday or Tuesday. So because I want to keep this keep this going. I'm sorry I've had to like have so many days in between readings, but I'm going to try to just do either shorter reads or not. I don't know. I'll, 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 I really want to do like um more regular, keep a more consistent schedule. So be on the lookout for that. Love you all. Thank you so much for reading with me and uh enjoy the rest of your sunday afternoon evening whatnot <laughs> bye everybody